Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, for those of you that are new, uh, welcome. We invite you to subscribe. It means the world. If you are returning, um, you're in for a hard 180 because we just spent six months and 13 hours on the Alien Predator saga. Um, so we invite you to check that out. But um, at the behest of Chad, uh, we are doing Desperately Seeking Susan. So you know if you loved Aliens and you love Predator, you're gonna it's love- It's a natural it. progression. It is, it really is. So yeah, we are gonna dive into the 19, what is it? 1987? No, 85. Just like filmed in 84, I believe. The 1985 Rosanna Arquette, Madonna, Aiden Quinn, and many, many other people clapped seeking Susan. So that Mark Blum. Yep. Let's uh, get our cocktails and uh, go turn it over to Chad to uh, get us started and cheers. Cheers. Well, I just want to say that um, I love this movie, obviously. This is the Blu-ray. So it is out on Blu-ray and looks amazing. I saw it in theaters. Um, actually, they brought it back and it looked incredible, like really good. Um, this is the novelization with an awesome photo of Madonna on the back. Add in his um, novel. Kind of at the, it, like a collision between film and like the zenith of Madonna's power in pop music. At, you, like right when everything you, was breaking for her. Did what? you just use the word zenith? Yeah. <laughs> Mary, Mary me continue. <laughs> so oh and I love this shot of her on the bed in the back with the cigarette in the mouth when it was still cool to smoke and she probably used that as like a film trope you know the whole smoking because I'm cool right. um long history of that in film you never see that anymore for good reasons but it's just kind of cool and um so one thing I wanted to touch on like right out, out of the gate is that the guy that plays Gary Glass in the film, mm -hmm. um, Mark Blum, he just you know, just passed away of coronavirus complications awesome. due to coronavirus. Uh, apparently, he was teaching in New York, um, teaching acting, and he also was doing a lot of Broadway, a lot of off Broadway. As recent as 2018, you can look up all the stuff he's done. Um, his other film that was big was like Crocodile Dundee, so. Probably shouldn't even have mentioned that, but uh, no, he's awesome. He's awesome in this movie. Like, he's it's, gone. It's it's a shame. So just to pay respects, we I wanted to say that right off the top. He's gone to the great oasis the store in the Gary's sky. Oasis. Yeah. <laughs> Gary's Oasis in the sky. So um, Robert Joy is awesome in this movie. Um, I should pull up the Wikipedia in a minute once you start talking. Yeah. Um, Susan Seidelman directed this, so female director. Um, this was supposed to be Rosanna Arquette's big movie. And I have a feeling that Madonna wasn't supposed to be quite so memorable or tied to this film as right. she was. But as soon as they cast Madonna, it became the Madonna movie. But also because um, her star was like, steadily rising so it was kind of a collision course and I don't think they realized it when they started filming they didn't need any security they were just with Madonna on the street filming by toward the end of the film it was like full security needed fans everywhere yeah. so that just shows you like the night and day difference between when they started filming and then toward the end of filming and, and had what, Like a Virgin as an she, album? She had her first album, which had some, like, catchy, obviously iconic singles, but it just wasn't, like, she wasn't a household name until the second album, which was Like a Virgin, which came out in November of 1984. So as soon as that came out, like, every girl wanted to be her, everyone was dressing like her, all that stuff. So that's when her career really took off, and she was kind of, like, warning people. <laughs> This yeah. is going to happen, and no one believed her, and boy, were they wrong, so. Amen. Of course. Anyway, I am, I'm reading this now. I have just got it recently. I'm reading it now. I have not finished it yet. It's pretty close to the movie, but just more, I guess, like, um, 
wistful and romantic kind of. But um, anyway, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's so 80s, but it's not really 80s in a stylized way. It's pretty realistic 80s. It's like a time capsule of downtown New York in that time. And of course, there's funny things now because it's 80s, but it's not funny in the way that like Aliens is so 80s, for example, or any other 80s movie is 80s. This is more like how life was in the 80s. And so it's very, like, matter of fact in the way it presents the 80s. It just happens to be an 80s movie, but it's such a great time capsule because of that. And, yeah. um, of course, Madonna did the song Into the Groove for this movie, which is one of her greatest, like, pop classics. And It's my favorite Madonna song, just FYI. It's definitely one of my favorites. It's so danceable, catchy, the synthesizers... There's a really great video online where someone breaks down like all the synth action going on in the song. So maybe we could link that. I'll send you the link for that. It's really good because they like recreate it and it's really professional. But um, yeah, so I'm in love with this era of the 80s and New York City at that time. Like just so much going on, so much life, so much art, so much like good music, so much um, just like Keith Haring, Andy Warhol, like all these incredible iconic people who were alive and making art in the city and just the energy that the city had. And um, like I said, it was supposed to be a sort of a star vehicle for Rosanna Arquette. And I think she felt slighted because it quickly became like the Madonna movie. And I don't know if it was at Madonna's request, but her Brits actually took this cover photo and Herberts has a long history of working with Madonna. He did her True Blue album cover where like her head is back. And um, so very iconic photo of Madonna. Um, so I think she kind of took over in a lot of ways and then made it onto the soundtrack. And of course they even promoted it as the Madonna movie. Yeah. But, um, and then after that, like Rosanna's Arquette, Arquette's career just kind of never like became like a, I, I still think she's great and had like a really interesting career, everything from Pulp Fiction to like other things that she's popped up in, yeah. but she never became that like leading actress, I guess, that this kind of poised her to be. Yeah. But um, yeah, so. It never reached quite the level of fame that Patricia did. Right. And in some iconic cult um, and films and given some stellar performances. Sure. Yeah, definitely. And now, um, you know, she's come forward with, like, Harvey Weinstein, one of the, some allegations. So it's just interesting. But I think she's been, like, kind of suppressed, too. But uh, it's, it's um, anyway, so I was, when I was a kid, I would watch this on VHS. And then, of course, I had the DVD and I have the Blu-ray. And I even have the CD soundtrack for it, which is mostly, like, the instrumental music, but it's still cool. And I think Madonna was thinking about doing like a whole album with a song called Desperately Seeking Susan that the way she did for Who's That Girl. So oh, for right. Who's That Girl in 1986, she did like a soundtrack for that film that had like four songs from her and then other other people. Um, so I think that she wanted to do that for Desperately Seeking Susan. But I think that they, they still were like, you're not that big yet. Right. But, um, okay. A calm down, <laughs> take a seat. But, um, yeah. and I sent you that footage of her, um, on set where she seems kind of like, um, just annoyed with how long movie making takes. So yeah. it's that thing where you always hear people say, like, hurry up and wait and yeah. while they're setting up all the lighting and everything. There's so much waiting on a film set. And she was so, like, ambitious and driven to, like, get everything going. So I'm sure she hated that, just, like, the endless waiting. But she's actually great in this. Like, a lot of people criticize her acting. Um, you know, it's warranted because it's it's very hit or miss, depending on the film. This is a hit film for her, definitely, in terms of her acting. Because she's basically just being herself. And she's um, drawing from her fashion, her street sensibility, uh, her street smarts and um, the fact that she really was like living out there in in New York City at that time and was like a mover and shaker at that time. So yeah. it's she's basically playing herself, but I think it's done really well. And there's a lot of like great iconic like moments. And I forgot how great the dialogue was too. Um, 
And I like that. I like that it's such a naturalistic film style. I'm, it's not like so stylized or anything, and it's not like a comedy, but there's so many funny parts. Right. Um, I just think it's great. It's definitely my kind of movie. It's probably, it's for sure in my top 20 films, maybe wow. even higher than that. Wow. But I have always loved this film. I love everyone in it. I love the story. I just, I think it's cool how Rosanna is that like, um, well, she's like the bored housewife, but she's also like very, she romanticizes that lifestyle that Susan, Madonna's character, lives mm -hmm. and, you know, wants to be a part of it and then ends up like li living it out, basically, which is kind of cool. Uh, I thought a lot when I was watching this about like voyeurism and how film is the ultimate like voyeuristic experience, but also how much... Um, uh, voyeur, voy, you know how many times there's scenarios in this film that set you up to be the, the voyeur where you're following people, you're mm -hmm. behind people, you're watching her follow people, there are people following her, so it's like this endless chain of that. And also, I've been watching a lot of Brian De Palma's films, and he is all about that. So Dress to Kill and um, Body Double are two where they have these sequences where you're following someone. And yeah. I love it because you're really like there with that person in that moment. And I just, I love that. I don't know why. And I mean, it's kind of creepy too, but it's like kind of what we all want to do is like look at people in public, yes. but you don't want to be obvious about it. But through film, you can just right. full on take everything in. You can live out the that fetish in, in a safe way, you know? Right. In and film. in a way where everyone, all parties are condoning it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. The, the interview, the little five minute Japanese, or it was dubbed in Japanese or subtitled rather in Japanese. I don't know uh, who was conducting the interview, but I'll link it in the description box. But it was just like this little clip of Herbie, you know, behind the scenes and to your point, you know, like you can see like she's ready to fucking be Madonna and like get shit done. <laughs> and like, yeah. You know, that she's just not, the rest of the world had not caught up with her yet. But For real. You, you have to, like, the fact that she's 27 years old when this movie's being made, she's already put out, what was the name of her first album? Before, it was like, just called Madonna. Oh, Madonna. The fact that that's already happened, the fact that she wrote the title track for a major motion picture at 27 into the groove, um, yeah. was prepared to do much more than that. Um, acts. Yeah very like I think she does a great job in this film to your point she is very much playing a um exaggerated version of herself but right. she, when she's given like the right material and that's a very narrow window in my opinion for Madonna right. he's a great right. act and, and she's yeah. almost like an anomaly like Nicolas Cage where like she will act horribly and then she'll hit you with Evita Evita <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, yeah, and and to her credit, even when you're playing a version of yourself, you still have to know how to act. You can't just like show up. Oh, I'm on a film set. Because a lot of people say that about her. Um, you still do know how how to have. You still do have to know how to play to a camera and and act, even yeah. if you're being yourself. Yes. Um, um, yeah. I you can keep talking. I'm just. I gotta turn a light on because I'm going dark real fast over here. Get that light, girl. Keep talking, keep talking. Um, so yeah, um, at this point in her career, she had released um, the singles Holiday, Lucky Star, Borderline, and Burning Up, and Everybody, if that counts, even though that was like kind of like a really early single, so, but it still counts. But um, the other singles were way more like um, promoted, I think, and had music videos and stuff, and it was those early days of MTV. Um, everything was just kind of like happening. I'm I'm so in love with the 80s. Um, I, I want to say like the to your point about 80s New York. Like looking back at like Madonna as the icon that she is, and both you and I are huge Madonna fans. She's certainly not without her issues. I think we can both agree that she does some stuff right. that's tone deaf, uh, uh, more so in recent years. But looking back at this movie and knowing what an icon she she is and how she's changed culture um, and knowing that even back then she was doing that. Like we know that 
80s New York, right? Like this movie is not a caricature, caricaturization of 80s New York. It really depicts it accurately. It's not overly stylized. It seems to be an honest depiction. And we know that Madonna was hanging out with Warhol. We know that she was good friends with Basquiat. You know, she was living that yeah. life with dancers, musicians, and artists. So I think that that this is like one of those kind of serendipitous moments in, in cinema where like you're seeing like a right place, right time, where she's right. a role that's an exaggerated version of herself, but like everything came together. Whereas if it had happened a year earlier or a year later, it may not have landed. Right, because it's good to know that they didn't write it for Madonna. So right. um, yes. she, her persona kind of overtook the role. So that in that sense, she started to play a version of herself just because the way she looked and the way she performed to the camera became such a integral part of her character but initially it wasn't written for her so the story in it and the lines and the character she is playing um something not not written for her right and definitely um but you have laurie metcalf as leslie glass um, i had completely forgotten upon until <laughs> movie for my homework take uh, a volume like a normal person that i have that in my notes it's in one of my quotes <laughs> take a volume like a normal person Lori metcalf is the queen yes. of all like Preach. and watching her in this movie and just like every time she is on the screen like she seals the scene like i can't even deal like right. her perm <laughs> Kudos to fucking Greta Gerwig, Gerwig for giving Laurie Metcalf like time to shine in Lady Bird because it was long over fucking due. Laurie Metcalf, Laurie Metcalf, Laurie Metcalf. And she plays yes. sister, uh, who is Rosanna Arquette's husband in the film. Correct? Right. Yeah. Right. She plays his sister. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, the opening shot of the of movie. Of course. Where it's just like that footage of like 80s salon and like the bowl hair dryers and then right there. I mean, it's just it's it's fucking iconic. I love this song too. They're playing um, the Shoop Shoop song. Does he love me? I want to know. How can I tell if he loves me yes, so? Yes, 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 yes. Um, that's like a great old like Motowny song, and it's so cool. Um, just to open with that and just the whole. Thing everything's so great about this movie but yeah of course laurie um metcalf we grew up watching in roseanne mm -hmm. and so that's uh she's so amazing um robert joy plays jim susan's boyfriend and he is awesome in this movie like he's this like really cool skinny guy that so is like the perfect guy for susan in this movie he's like so he's like a little twerp he's like all spun up over susan Love him. He's like in love with her. He worships her. Um, Aiden Quinn is like hot in this movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, just, he's so his hot. His and his pleated pants. Iconic. Yeah, definitely. We literally have Aiden arrow gay question mark arrow suspenders. Like. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Just good, fa good, lots of good fashion in this film. Except, you know what is so funny is like when it's so funny because the film didn't even try to do this, but as soon as they made this film, they were mirroring what was happening in real life because Rosanna in the film, Roberta, is the ultimate like Madonna wannabe. Yeah. And when she dresses like Susan, it's a facsimile. I mean, yeah. straight off the bat, like it looks just like not Madonna. Right. It's very clear that that style is not of her. Right. So, um, which I always get that same impression from like the Madonna wannabes when they only dress that way for like her concert or whatever. It's yeah. these girls with a scrunchie and a, a skirt Madonna would never wear or something. Right, right. But <laughs> um, it's just funny because like that was really going on. Like all these young girls were trying to dress like Madonna and were so fascinated by her and wanted to escape their life and be more like her. And that's yeah. exactly what's going on in this film that was written before any of that was even thought of. Right. Yeah. Insane. Yeah, it's crazy. And then... I... Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. 
Um, I don't know. I was going to walk us through more of the cast, but those are all the main players. I what was, were you going to say? I, as far as the cast is concerned, there was two people, well, three people I had completely forgotten were in the movie, one being Laurie Metcalf. Uh, the second one being um, Stephen Wright, the comedian, like the classic 80s and 90s comedian, Stephen Wright is in it. And I think he plays the brother or like a friend of Laurie Metcalf. And, and he's Gary. like a doctor friend. Yeah. Uh, but he's basically, he's the same exact character in Desperately Seeking Susan that he is in Half Baked and has, he is in every movie and every like, stand-up special where he's just like monotone bum on the couch and i'm a huge fan of stephen wright's comedy um but i just totally had forgotten that he was in this because this movie came out when i was it came out in 85 i was three years old um i watched it religiously as a kid but like not at three years old i was a couple years older than that so a lot of these people i had forgotten about and then the villain in the movie the bleach blonde hair guy that is chasing Susan throughout the movie is played by Will Patton, who I didn't ever realize like that that was him, but he's had a pretty amazing career since Desperately Seeking Susan. Will Patton has been in, like, name an action movie. Like, he was in Armageddon. Like, Will Patton has been in, like, just so many films. And then you go back and you watch Desperately Seeking Susan, and he's just, like, in this, like, B movie playing this D-list role. I mean, it's just such a trip, but, um, yeah. you know, to your point about the facsimile and how Susan, when she, when there's like the role reversal and she's dressing and acting like Susan and living out this fantasy of being this woman that she's not in real, in her own personal life, like it and just. In, and in Into the Groove, she says, live out your fantasy. Live out your fantasy here with me. Um, it just takes me back to, like, my memories of watching this as a kid and, like, re-watching this movie and all of the scenes that I had remembered vividly mm-hmm. that are, like, getting in a time machine and also ones that are, like, I had completely forgotten about. But the point I want to make is the, you, you mentioned the voyeuristic, like, tone of the movie where, what is Rosanna Arquette's character's name? Roberta. Roberta, thank you. Roberta is obsessed. She is herself desperately seeking Susan. So she's obsessed right. with this personals ad that she's been following where this guy and girl are communicating with each other across time and across, you know, country or <laughs> states as they travel and they meet up via the personals ad and she's obsessed with it. And Susan Which is Hall- such a cool premise. Like I it, love that. And you could you could never do that in today's no. And, It'd be like Tinder. It'd be, yeah. Yeah. Not, and it'd be also really cool. But the fact yeah. that, you know, basically girl stalking Susan um, and having this voyeuristic, like, experience where she's literally chasing her, following her, buying right. her clothes, you know. Well, she's like a hopeless romantic in, like, a dead end yeah. marriage, and she's a board housewife and she's excited by this romantic lifestyle that Susan leads where she's um, basically a couch sh- couch surfing street urchin that just goes from city to city and is trapped by all these like guys, yeah. As agency, whereas she doesn't because she is married to, rest in peace, uh, Gary, who basically is the yeah. uh, Oasis Jacuzzi King of New Jersey. Yes. He's fucking uh, a control just massagist and he gaslights her the whole yes. movie. It's hilarious. But this movie at the end of the day, like for me, is the ultimate girl crush movie. You know, yeah. this is a love story, not about like Susan and Robert Joy's character. And it's not a love story about anybody else. It's not a re- love story between Roberta and Aiden Quinn's character. It's a love story for me about Roberta and Susan. And it's just so fantastic. And I love when she's in the salon and she says to um, Laurie Metcalf's character, uh, oh, I'm desperate. <laughs> and yes. Laurie's like, desperate you? Ha <laughs> ha! It's so good. It's like this fake yeah. laugh. It's so funny. It's so great. Oh, I wait. Oh, the person on the cast, though, John Turturro is in this movie. I forgot John Turturro was in this movie. He's the owner of the nightclub where they have Oh, this- right. 
He's I, like the sleazebag nightclub, a magic club owner. He's amazing. And I, again. Yeah, he's like, hello. <laughs> oh my God, I love it. Um, So we were talking about like John Turturro being in this movie and being the magic club owner. Um, And again, you know, before John Turturro, like the prime of his career, obviously, but the, this, the magic the scenes with the magic and like the girl in the box and the magician, like slicing the girl up, like both the scene earlier in the movie and the scene at the end of the movie when Roberta's is actually the girl in the box. Like that's like for me getting in a time machine because as soon as I see like that imagery on screen, like I am seven years old again, eight years old, nine years old, whatever. Right. My living room on VHS and just like I'm in that space and time. It's so, it's just a time machine. Like, I don't know what else to say. It like, totally is. That and, like, the, first of all, you know, just to cycle back to Madonna's iconic style, um, which this is, like, one of Madonna's first, like, iterations, if you will, of, like, her style throughout history is, like, leggings, a skirt or a tutu, a lot of lace, a lot of mesh. I wrote mesh in all caps because there's so much of it. Um, bangles, lots of rubber bracelets, bracelets. right? Mm -hmm. Lots of bracelets. We have lots of scrunchies. So we're in this like moment for Madonna, but like the jacket that she wears that supposedly owns Hendrix with the pyramid on it. So oh, iconic. The hat box. The hat box, when I think of Desperately Seeking Susan, I think of the hat box. With the skeletons? Yes. And yes. It's what Madonna uses, not to carry hats in, but just like her personal effects. Like it's it just is a hat box, isn't it? Wow, it's a yeah. Black hat box. And it's she just um, uses it as her suitcase. Yeah. 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 And it's so, it's just amazing. And it's awesome. The There's a lot of iconic props like that. Oh my god. Oh my god. The scene early on in the movie where Madonna gets into the terminal, the bus terminal, I forget, like New York City Transit Authority, whatever. Right. Goes to the bathroom to freshen up and you see the iconic scene flips the hand dryer up and is like drying her armpits. This is everything. Like when I yes. think really seeking Susan, that is the image that comes to mind. And the, uh -huh. like, woman standing behind her that's, like, got curlers in her hair. And <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that um, moment up because <laughs> that is such an iconic moment, and I would have totally oh. forgot to even mention it. it it's incre an incredible, iconic moment for her. And yeah. they, they even made an action figure of her, like, with the, with the air dryer, like, where she can do that, like, as an action figure. That's what I want for Christmas. Crazy. Or my birthday, whichever comes first. Yeah, I mean, it just, we already talked about take a volume like a normal person. We talked about, I just mentioned lace and mesh. Um, How do you use the birds? <laughs> do you remember that line? Yes. When um, Roberta gets in the car and they picked her up because they think she's a hooker and she gets in the car with a real hooker who turns to her because she has birds from her magic act. And the real hooker says, how do you use the birds? <laughs> so great. Great. It's so great. We it doesn't to... try to be funny as a comedy, but it no. is so in inherently funny. But let's, but, but just for a moment, from the opening scene to the various scenes, both in the beginning of the movie where Madonna's in the hotel room of the gangsters, whatever, whom she steals the earrings from, to later on in the film where she is with um, Gary, um, trying to like get Looking hot. yeah toenail painting and cotton between the toes the yes toes, like there's something about not just like nail, nail, fingernail painting but something about toenail painting is inherently 80s to me yeah like, and she has the um she has the headphones on that have the foam pieces like the orange foam pieces and it's like a tape player a cassette player like a walkman covered in seashells like somebody like took the receiver of the phone and like oh yes spells all over it so you would it reminds me of Cindy Lauper actually that phone but like the tone 
painting is just... It's 80s realness. It's not trying to be 80s. It just was. Like, so uh, how many times we say iconic in this fucking video because yeah. this shit is just iconic. And I haven't even gotten to my favorite iconic thing, but I'll save that for last. I'm done for now. Chad, please help me. Continue. Um, so one thing that I notice every time I watch this is how they juxtapose Gary's Oasis um, spa commercials. So, of course, they're, like, really cheesy and horrible commercials, right? Um, as they're supposed to be. Yes. But we open the film, like, fairly early in the film. After, after a few scenes, we, we get to see this commercial. And, of course, we see it. Um, he's at a party at his house with his wife and their yuppie friends. Yes. And he's like, oh, oh, I've got a spot on. And they, they all crowd around the TV and watch Gary's Oasis commercial where he's with these bimbos. And, 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 of course, it's in English. Um, later on in the film... Um, oh, my God, yes. Rosanna Arquette hits her head, of course, and she now thinks she's Susan through a series of events, and she assumes this lifestyle of Susan. And while she has amnesia, she sees his commercial again on TV, but she's in, like, a sketchy part of town, and she's in somebody's um, security... She's asked a security guard for help. So it's, it's, he has it on the Spanish channel and it's in Spanish. And she like pauses for a minute. Like she knows who that is, but it's so funny because it's in Spanish and, and she has amnesia and she's not her. And it's like this great, brilliant thing that they did. Yeah. So I just, I love that. Number one. Of the movie, not trying to be funny and being funny. It's funny, but it's also like, um, who are it's kind of deep in a way it's it's kind of brilliant because it's like who are we and then um it's like a day it's like a, there's themes of deja vu that yeah. kind of repeat and that's like a perfect exemplary like deja vu moment where she doesn't know why she knows who that is but she's like i that seems really familiar to me and then of course they have it in spanish so it's like she's not gonna perfectly get it but yeah. um I wanted to say that, like, she certainly has a crush on Madonna's character, but it's also, like, a lifestyle crush. Right. So it's that whole, like, romantic lifestyle. And then you can get into, like, lifestyle porn, which we all, like, it's so, like, prevalent now, like, with Instagram and all that crap, where everyone is, like, selling, like, lifestyle. They're selling lifestyle. Well, this was, like, a kind of, like, a lifestyle um, yeah. romance for um, Roberta. I didn't think film. about so spot on that's exact it was the 80s version of yeah. right and so it's just funny um she's clearly unhappy in her marriage she's definitely not as wild as susan but it's just great that she gets to like live through her for for a little bit for fun yeah. you get the sense that at the end when her amnesia is over and she she's gonna go back to being herself but she's not going to go completely back to that, like, housewife. She'll never really be that again. But she's even more herself. But she's also not Susan. So it's, like, a clear distinction there that's interesting. I mean, she's her own person by the end. Um, we, I wanted to talk about the alternate ending that they did. Okay. So this movie was based, inspired in part by the 1974 film Celine et Julie... Uh, Vaunt and Bastio. I'm, I know I'm not pronouncing that right. right, but Celine and Julie go boating is the English title. Um, I don't know. I've never seen it, but um, apparently uh, Susan uh, Seidelman, who directed this, um, kind of based it on that. And so it has this alternate ending where they go on an adventure as characters together that I think ties it more closely to that but they didn't end up using it which is a good thing because it's kind of silly and cheesy did you get a chance to watch it mm -mm. so in the scene instead of like it ending how it ends um with just madonna in the movie theater eating popcorn um and them winning an award for um coming forward with those earrings yeah um they they all that happens and then they go they take some of the award money and they go to Egypt together. No. <laughs> and so you see them like riding off in uh, like on camels and Roberta's really happy about it. And Madonna's like, I wanted to go to Jamaica. <laughs> Whoa. 
Okay. Which is like uh, so, which is like so Madonna. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll insert the clip because I have to watch it. Yeah. 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 So it's interesting. It's great to see as like a film relic, but definitely they made the smart choice not to do it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about like who was up for these, some of these key roles of Susan and Roberta. Oh my God. So yeah. the, the filmmakers initially wanted Diane Keaton and Goldie Hawn to play Roberta and Susan. Could you Can imagine? You? <laughs> they were already a little bit older, of course, than Madonna and Rosanna Arquette. So I mean. the, the director decided to cast newcomers Arquette and Madonna because this, uh, in part because she wanted to and the studio wanted the film to appeal to younger audiences. Bruce Willis was up for the role of Dez. Um, who is who is um, Jim, Madonna's boyfriend's best friend, who ends up like taking care of Susan for his friend. Yeah. Um, so that was almost Bruce Willis. And then um, a few other people that were going to play Madonna's role include Melanie Griffith, um, Ellen Barkin, Jennifer Jason Lee and Suzanne Vega, who I'm a huge fan of. Um, the amazing musician Suzanne Vega auditioned for the role, and that would have been like a whole, it actually probably would have worked, but like in a really different way. Yeah, and um, Jennifer would have been pretty epic too. Right, so, but the right thing happened. Oh, <laughs> Let, lest anyone get carried away here. You know what you're to go to. No, I can't imagine Melanie Griffith, though. It would have made it like a, like, I love Melanie Griffith, but it would have made it a silly comedy. It wouldn't have had that gritty, like right. Yeah. It wouldn't have, uh, actually, Melanie can do, like, some gritty roles, but I just, come on, it had to be Madonna. I'm glad that they, I'm glad that they put, like, an unknown, or two relatively unknown people. Right. Like, like Sigourney Weaver in Alien. And we should like when 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 I hit like one million subscribers, we should take all of that money and produce the unproduced Goldie Hawn Diane Keaton version of Death Valley Yeah, at the age they're at now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and Bruce Willis. Obviously. We gotta get him in there. And Suzanne Vega can do the soundtrack. <laughs> it's done. Agreed. Um, I wanted to say that. Um, and I forgot about this. There is a lost song that Madonna wrote, a demo she made called Desperately Seeking Susan. So she actually wrote like a title track that none of us have ever heard. And um, apparently she spent a good amount of time on it. And then she did like in like 30 minutes, she wrote and recorded into the groove as like almost like a B-side, a throwaway. She's, I mean, lest you doubt her, her, her talent or her brilliance. That's not easy to do. Anyway, it's like a perfect song. Literally my favorite Madonna song. Like So she wrote that like really quickly as like a B-side. Vogue was also like a really quickly written B-side mm -hmm. that um, they quickly realized should be like a single. So I guess when she approached the filmmakers, they, they really wanted to go with Into the Groove and they didn't end up using Desperately Seeking Susan at all. And there never became like an album soundtrack for the film in that way that Madonna did. I would kill to hear Desperately Seeking Susan as a song. It's probably so good. Let's slide into her DMs. You never know what could happen. <laughs> she doesn't care about her past anymore, but I digress. Listen, let's she... go a separate video. Like Yes, that is. Um, uh, I want to I still we need to review um we need to do a movie hour on um, um Truth or Dare. Yes, thank you. Because and Strike a Pose, the new documentary of where the dancers are at now, which is yeah. great. Uh deeply upsetting, but yes. Um so many things. Oh. I'm sorry. Continue. That's okay. I wanted to say that the New York Times ranked this in the 10 best films of 1985, which is pretty awesome. I I think I think it's a really great film. I think it's underrated. Um, Highly underrated. Even past, like, if you get past Madonna's, like, how much she, like, um, I don't know what the right word is. Not overshadows, but, I mean, it really became such a Madonna movie. But even, 
if you can disassociate that from that long enough to appreciate it, it's such a great movie on its own merits. I agree. I mean, there's some great, I mean, we've already mentioned some of like the great one-liners, but, and I forget who said it, but somebody, you know, again, to your point about it, not trying to be a comedy, but it just ends up having these very natural and organic funny moments where yes. I, I think somebody's saying it to, I think it might actually be somebody saying it to Susan. I don't know, but they were like, I thought you were dead. And they were like, no, I was just in New Jersey. Yeah. She's when she's going into the magic club, the cigarette girl, she knows her and they strike up a conversation. Yes. And, yeah. I thought you were dead. We all, God, we all thought you were dead just in New Jersey. And like, <laughs> and the then, moment, like, and the- Roberta says to her, um, do you, when, when Roberta, or no, no, not Roberta, but she, Susan has a friend in the movie that's a small role, um, like a best friend, and she wants to couch, you know, crash on her couch. Yeah. And she's her- like, do you promise only 10 digit or seven digit phone seven. numbers? Yeah. That's I, a great, that's a great line. And there's a moment like towards the end of the movie, like in the third act when like Susan and Gary, like everybody are finally like gonna like finally meet and like right. figure out what's going on. And like Madonna says, and I quote, fortunately for everyone here, I'm thinking, you know, like, <laughs> yes, there to fucking like take control of the same. She tells family. Gary, like, give me your, give me your car keys. Yeah. And, and, the hot and Laurie Metcalf's character is like, Gary, she is taking the car keys. <laughs> and he's like, shut up, Leslie. <laughs> the whole movie's so quotable. I love when, I love when Madonna is like in his spa, like leaning backwards like that. And then she's like, got any pot? And he's like, normally I keep some around, but right now I'm out. Because he's trying to, like, look cool. <laughs> so great. Oh, Gary. Rest in peace, Gary. Um, yeah. Oh, like, there's there's another iconic scene. Well, two things I want to say really quickly. Like, upon rewatching this, like, I, I noticed it for the first time. But there's a scene when the dog is at, I believe, Gary's house, where she comes out of the pool and, like, you know, does the whole thing and then climbs out yeah. of the ladder. In her bra and boxers. Oh my God, this is the exact same shot as Phoebe Cates coming out of the pool in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Like, right. the same thing. Like, obviously, Fast Times came out in 85. This came out, um, what? No, 85. sorry. 85. This came out in 85. So, right. But it was the it's literally frame for frame Phoebe Cates coming out of the pool. Right. Just Donna. And then but all the cheese doodles. So much cheese doodles. Like <laughs> I like, love it. Like generic Cheetos. Cheese doodle action. Realness. Doodles. Oh my god. When well, Madonna has her cheese doodles in a bowl and she's eating them with chopsticks. Oh my god. It's so amazing. Them with chopsticks, but she's got a bowl full of cheese doodles and then there's right. chopsticks. Like, take me to church. Yes. The, the Church of Madonna. She's so amazing in this. I love it. All right. She's that she's the epitome of a free spirit. I mean, if you're she's got no ties, she's like, you know. It makes it makes you wonder what happened to Susan, like later on, because you can't really live like that forever. Not to say that she should settle down, but she definitely would have you know, morphed and I don't know. Maybe she would have always just been like going around. Destined to meet Roberta so that they could balance each other out. That's a know, great point. Yeah. And like together as BFFs, you know, um, they could do anything. They could literally, they, they made it into the papers, you know, like they yes. earned the stolen earrings. They went to fucking Egypt and rode camels, you know. <laughs> Susan, isn't it beautiful? I still think we should have gone to Jamaica. Yeah. Madonna wanted to go to Jamaica. Well, naturally. But, you know... Where the hot boys are in the sun and she can lay around and eat cheese doodles. Where she can be waited upon as the queen that she is. Um, But you you mentioned earlier on and... um, this will be like one of the two last things I have to say, hopefully. 
Um, like you mentioned earlier on about, you know, the facsimile that Susan as, or excuse me, that Roberta as Susan is, where she's trying to emulate this girl she has a monogamous, you know, platonic girl crush on. But this was happening in the real world at that very moment where every girl that I knew, right. not just white girls, every girl I knew was yes. dressing like this iteration. So, of the so they were going to the theater living vicariously through Roberta, who in the film is living vicariously through Susan. <laughs> yes, and like, I never dressed like Madonna. It just, I never- I like, did. <laughs> I need pictures. Way after it was cool. I need pictures. We will insert them. Um, I never really dressed up like anybody. I never like emulated anybody in the way I dressed. Right. I fangirled pretty hard. I, I I would get obsessed. But there was a girl that lived because I was watching this movie from the time I was probably like six, seven years old. You know up until I was probably like eight years old, like every weekend, you know, like for two years straight, like I would rent this movie or be on TV. Like I was obsessed with this movie as was everybody. But there was a girl that lived in my apartment complex growing up. That was like, she lived in the unit next to me and upstairs who looking back on this era in my life, she couldn't have been more than eight years old that looked Every day, she dressed, her mom let her dress like, like Madonna, <laughs> Madonna, like three-quarter leggings, black leggings, a tutu, right. lace or a match, something over a black tank top. Why is it always a tutu? Because Madonna really never wore that Krendel skirt type look that much, <laughs> if that, at all. Like, I've never really seen her with a tutu. I think she did it, like, maybe one video for, like, a shot or something, but, like, the yeah. whole aesthetic, like this little girl, eight years old, seven years old, probably, like I just living her best life had a girl crush on her, like my neighbor, because right. it's like, so fucking cool. And she moved away, but like she literally, like, teased hair, side pony, loving, I'm let her wear black eyeliner, like j just the cutest. It thing was very ever. controversial then because yeah. basically a lot of parents thought that because Madonna was such a sexually liberated woman that the, that the kids were dressing like, that they wanted to be like a whore or something. I think yeah. we were more in danger of that being the case today than we were back then. I think back then it was just like innocence and like you just wanted to like dress up like a Barbie and Madonna was the cool Barbie, you know? Whereas now like girls that age are doing things like, don't even get me started. Right. Like, and the whatnots and it's like no we well, just well there's so much more awareness of like human trafficking and yeah. child um abuse now yeah. so there's a lot more awareness and there's a lot of problems right now with that so yeah. definitely those things are probably ex exacerbated from that time but I, um you could get away with little girls dressing like 80s madonna now today because we're in 2020 but Back then, it was it it didn't feel right. like, an, like an aggressive sexualization. It was just like little girls right. playing. You know what I mean? I mean, what? Yeah, it, it, but Madonna was definitely from the start uh, oh. for herself pushing that boundary. Yeah, she yeah. was always saying like pushing the boundary of what was appropriate for women to wear, like on TV, yes. for female pop stars to wear or or to do or how to act. She was always pushing that sexual liberation boundary. Thank God. The world, because the world now we're more liberated as a society because of Madonna. She shaped culture. The world would not be what it is. The Western world would not be what it is without Madonna. Yeah. Do not take that away from her. And if sure. you agree, then um, unsubscribe. Like you're not. That's the brilliance of Madonna. Like she really did have that cultural cu cultural impact in a way that is it's so different now because there there's almost like more people that are famous and all to a lesser degree. But back then we have to remember like the Michael Jacksons, the Madonna, it was such a more mythic type of fame. And it was so like almost just this, just like otherworldly level of fame that people 
like even Lady Gaga doesn't really have that level of, of fame because society in the world is so different now and people are so much more connected. And what Andy Warhol said in the 80s was that everyone would have their 15 minutes of fame and that totally became true. So everything's different now and it was a different time and um, her, so her impact was like almost heightened on culture yes. because of that perfect storm of culture and, and the things that she was introducing which were exciting and new and the way that she was doing them and how, how famous she really was and allowed her to m make a huge difference in the way that women are allowed to um, act and dress and behave in ways that only men were at that time and still be like intelligent and beautiful and um all those things so yeah. um like and not just for women hats off to madonna lgbtq people obviously um but yeah right. i mean the, More the, yeah I, I you're spot on and, and you're naming it that we have a lot more famous people now, but to a much lesser degree, i.e. YouTube, right? Like everybody can be famous. Right. Channel. We're famous. <laughs> we are. We are, we are influencers, obviously. But yeah. um, it cannot be under, uh, excuse me, it cannot be overstated to anyone watching this that is a younger millennial, because I guess we qualify as el elder millennials, but anyone born 90 and after, I'll even say like 2000 and after, I'll be generous here. Like it cannot be overstated what like Michael Jackson and Madonna were like as the queen and king, the top, like, king and queen level yeah. of like, yeah, the deification and of these two people and no one has come close. People and so much of what they were doing hadn't been done. Now it's almost like everything is, is like yeah. almost a tribute to these things they introduced. Mm -hmm. Every female pop star is a female pop star the way that they are a female pop star, in part because of Madonna and her like setting that tone of like um, freedom with sexuality and um, the way that she knew her awareness of camera and the way that she would could play to camera and her awareness of fashion and her awareness of of impact and and her her ability to be so in 100 percent in control of her career as a woman in yeah. a male driven industry like the recording industry yeah it's so it's, amazing it, we this is just like an aside that just came to me because i'm guilty of this too but like it just a, a, i had an epiphany i praise Madonna for doing that, like for being 100% in control and like the architect and manipulator of her own image. And I demonized Taylor Swift for doing the same thing. And that's very interesting mm. to me to check myself and like, why? But I find myself in very similar conundrums. Yeah. I don't know why. Side. And I don't know if it's because I'm so beholden to Madonna and like nobody else can do anything that she it's does. It's a good point. Um, Madonna was a shrewd businesswoman in a way that wasn't allowed in pop music for women before that because of the recording industry being so kind of male dominated yeah. and oppressive in that way. Um, so there's there's so there's subtle differences between calculating and um, like I perceive certain artists now as like over the top in terms of calculating. I think Madonna was, it came from like a place of, of ambition, but it, it's different. It's, it's hard. That's like a whole other, con that's like a long, it, it, it was just, it was just an aside that came. That is definitely a great point. Uh, I, I often think about that too. But I, I want to let you finish all of your thoughts. The only other thing I wanted to say was the the scene on the dance floor in the second act where you get to see Madonna in the club dance to yes. her fucking title track into the groove. Which it's I not a title track because it's it oh, called well, into the groove. But okay, all right. Well, <laughs> get it right. No, I'm kidding. I'm so sorry. I kid. 
Um, but so yeah, no, that's an amazing moment. And she was such a club figure at that time. So you're getting that glimpse into like what it was like to see Madonna in an 80s dance club in New York City at that time, which was is so incredible because that's what she came up in by giving her demos to the DJs and working those clubs and performing in those clubs with her brother and her friends and um, uh, such a magical time. It's ridiculous. The way she moves, like the way she dances to Into the Groove is like one of my favorite dances. Yeah. Just like everything is just like yes. fucking iconic. Like, yes. The last, like not the last shot of the movie, but one of the last shots of the movie is with Madonna and Robert Joy's character in the movie theater eating popcorn. And you mentioned this earlier, like that is another one of those like iconic scenes. Yeah. And one movie that like, it's like a time machine. Like every time I see that, I'm like seven years old in my room watching it again on VHS. Like Beaker just, Street Cinema. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it just, yeah. It, it just shrinks my world. And it's just like, oh, I remember what it felt like to be watching that yeah 30 years ago and, and i love that he really feeds her the popcorn and madonna loves popcorn in real life she said that's like her favorite snack or whatever you um, heard it first folks yeah so it's just kind of like funny all those things that are so madonna in this movie but um oh it's awesome it looks great on blu-ray too but i don't have any more to say about this um as you know madonna's inspired my music so um I would say that like it's funny because so I was born in the early to mid 80s 80 at the, I was born at the end the very end of 83 we'll we'll get specific and <laughs> when I was like working on wanting to make my own music like starting back like in in the late 90s um I was really looking back to the 80s. So I was just like uh, in my diapers through most of the 80s. And by like 1990, I had turned six. So that's when Vogue came out. And that's when Madonna like really came on my radar and blew my mind with like the gay voguing scene that she brought to the mainstream. Um, but all the music I was listening to in the 90s growing up was really like 80s music for some reason. I just wanted to go back to the 80s. I didn't think a lot of stuff, I mean, there was a lot of cool stuff in the 90s too, but I didn't think any of it was as cool as what was had gone on in the 80s. I was like, the 80s is where it's at. So I, for some reason, just always went back to the 80s and um, film it, and music. So like your most romanticized like era for you? It ha was for forever, and now I think I'm finally moving past that. So, like, the stuff I make now, the music I'm making and stuff is more, it's just more synth and electronic, and it's less of an era. But I definitely started off, like, I want to make a music. <laughs> because the 80s was so cool to me and this is like a big part of that is just growing up watching this film and um, all of Madonna and Michael Jackson's early music. Um, I don't know why, but I just thought it was better music than, than the stuff in the 90s. I mean, the 90s, you started having like the, the new age, like the second generation of female pop stars starting to come through with the beginnings of like Mandy Moore and Jessica Simpson and Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera um, and all the boy bands in sync and 98 Degrees and the Backstreet Boys and all that and Spice Girls like by the mid 90s. And I found all that like way, way more calculated than Madonna actually in, in a certain way. Like Madonna was very calculating with the business part of her, her career, but I thought she was way more natural with like the artistic part of her career. If I um, may, I think yeah to me is something uh, that is categorically different between somebody like Madonna and somebody like you know the girl and boy bands that you met pop stars in general and this might even apply to somebody like Taylor Swift and I'm only using Taylor Swift as an example because 
she is demonized by a lot of people as being very calculating, um, is that Madonna was the calculator, whereas now the production company and the management. Right, have, exactly. Uh, That's are, such a great uh, distinction. Pulling the strings. No, I don't yes. know if that's the case with Taylor. I don't know. But I'm just saying, like, that's such a great distinction. Good, like, delineator of, like, it's one thing to be, like, calculated yes. versus, like, the people behind you pulling the strings being calculated. Right. Madonna worked her ass off to become a musician, to get a record contract. And she did it by, like, writing her own songs, really putting the work in, and being a legitimate performer, performing in clubs. She wasn't, like, put, and, and all of her fashion and everything was brought by her to right. the record company. They didn't, like, formulate her and, like, make the boy band and choose the members, right. put an ad in the paper, like, and form even, the band. Lou Pearlman didn't, like, design her clothing. No. So it's, like, that stuff is so uncool to me compared to, like, what Madonna did and what Madonna was doing. I just don't think a lot of people get it, but... I don't... And... and, and and to your point, um, oh my god, did I just forget what I was gonna say? Um, fuck, I think I just lost it. Madonna, Madonna, calculating, calculating costumes, went to management. When when you're when you're doing it yourself versus when you have a push of a team behind you and yeah, yeah. and I, I I just had an example. I, it it'll come back to me. It's Clearly was not that important, but like, yeah, well, it, you're, you're spot on. Like you were spot, spot on. Like, and yeah. I think that desperately Susan is like the perfect, easy introduction yeah. uh, for our audience into like deeper dives that we're likely going to do into Madonna's career, like with Truth or Dare, yeah. Strike a Pose, and oh yeah. my god, the dog. Madonna, Madonna <laughs> brought the camera, like, into every aspect of her life, obviously not every, but, like, into so aspects of her life that was, that was unprecedented, not just like, for time, but even today. Nobody right. knew what Madonna did. No one is taking people, like, people are doing documents. Reality TV, before people, reality TV. Musicians are doing documents, like, you see Taylor Swift, Gaga, like, Katy Perry. Like, you see pop mm -hmm. who documentaries, but they're not doing the doc. They're not, like, having just some, like, small film crew. It's highly produced. It's produced by the streaming service or the management company or the network. Like, Madonna mm -hmm. was bringing people. It's par for the course now. And Madonna, like, created that template. No one had done it before. Madonna did um, Truth or Dare. And when she released Truth or Dare, it was one of the highest grossing documentaries of in history at the time and um it it was so genius and you know um real real world with mtv that reality show that really kicked off reality television that was not even a thought yet like this is like a good however many years before that um and it was like the ultimate like reality experience of like a pop star i see you lady gaga with your black and white footage in your documentary a little too close, a little on the nose. I've always <laughs> Lady Gaga to be extremely reductive, and when Madonna yeah. interview, it must be ten years old now. This interview. It's Madonna. like if or she know. Okay, so say she, say she legitimately isn't trying to be like Madonna, then why would you put yourself in those situations that are so exact, as uh, similar to Madonna, like with the documentary where you have like behind the scenes is black and white and then on stage is color. That is so like right out of truth or dare. And I'm she knows you, that. I'm gonna tell you right now, I think Lady Da Lady Dada. I think Lady Gaga is extremely talented as a singer songwriter, as a pianist, sure. and, away from, and even as a vocalist. Not taking it away from her. I don't particularly care for her music never have. I can't stand her shtick. I can't stand her like right. on <laughs> Madonna reinvented Same. herself just as, a, as an analogy. Let's say Madonna reinvented herself every year. Lady Gaga reinvents herself every, like, one and a half, like, months. Right. It's almost like you have it, to up the ante. Like, where does it stop? Like, she took yeah. that, she took that, um, 
formula and then she's like she like sped it up and it just doesn't work that way it and doesn't work anymore it does not work and it's so falls apart like i would rather like that's i think that's why um not to go off on a whole lady gaga moment here but i think that's why her performance in a star is born was so good is because she was just singer songwriter there was no pretense there was no production there was no right perform like perform performative be whatever an artist do your thing get in costume but like it's not working for mel and um what, what i i think she's way more calculated than taylor swift like how she she you can see her like shifting back and forth between like the no antics gaga and the antics gaga it's like True. oh i need some more attention i'm gonna do the like the high fashion antics gaga and then, oh, now I'm going to go sing with um, Tony Bennett. It's going to be, like, really stripped down. Now I'm back to the other Gaga. Oh, now I'm going to do A Star is Born. But, like, it's that way of, like, the consistent antics was getting tiresome. So she is, yeah. like, switching it up. But she has the talent to back it up. Like, it does. But she can definitely sing and all that. Like, it's not my, the it's not what I would like to hear. But The, the theatrics yeah. detract from it. And theatrics, I think only a few artists can get away with the theatrics in the way that Madonna or Prince or Michael Jackson, right. you know, you know, and what's, you know, what's so funny is like Gaga is like, she would have been like, in that era, she would have been like so much bigger in a way. She almost like, I don't want to, maybe I'm giving her too much credit, but she definitely wants to be Bowie, Michael Jackson, Madonna. She like oh, wants so. to be of that era and of that level, but the whole world like has already, moved on from that. Right. Like so far, we're so far removed from that. That's never gonna be that way again. She's never gonna, so, but it seems like that's what she's going for. That's a really good point, yeah. And and I, I just wanna say one thing, like as much as like we, are, this video is about Madonna and we've gone on a whole fucking rant uh, and, a, and a sidebar on Madonna, which I, I totally expect and I'm, I'm totally here for, um, I think it's important, like, Madonna, you know, there was also Janet Jackson, and Janet Jackson set a precedent that has not been able to be matched either, in my opinion, um, vocally, dance-wise, theatrically, performative um, by pop stars. You had, you had to be a much more well-rounded entertainer that was way, had, like, huge lung capacity, ex extreme fitness, extreme rehearsals on point there was no auto tune no auto tune there was no live digital tuning there was maybe a little reverb like you're out there on your own you better bring it and people don't have to do that anymore it's all there's so much live like magic that goes yeah. on that people don't realize <laughs> on stage now that they didn't have back then they didn't, they, no no so yeah i mean it, but i want to i want to circle back um to, to your music, um, unless you have anything else to say about Desperately Seeking Susan. Oh, oh, um, no, I don't have anything else to say. I think I got all the main points out. Um, you used the word zenith. Yes. I, uh -huh. okay. I, I used lots of good vocabulary words in this video. I tried. Um, um, I want to talk about um, your alter ego Prince Lightmare, and uh, um, for those of you who have seen the Chad and Mel movie hours from day one when we did Annihilation last year, um, up and through the Alien versus Predator saga, you know that um, we do a little bit of a shout out to Chad's music catalog um, in the description and at the end of each video, but your alter ego is Prince Lightmare, and you were speaking earlier to the fact that this yeah. Madonna in the 80s was such an influence on you. Right. Um, I want you to just talk yeah. about your music. Well, yeah, and so I I think creating Prince Lightmare was like a um like a true way to like create an alter ego that like lived in the 80s that was like could be that like 80s thing. And so um yeah, that's what that was all about, but it's and not every song was 80s on that, but it was so much fun to create the ones that, like, were really 80s. Like, I have one called Love Crush that was, like, all the way 80s. But um, 
even like my style and everything, I used to always wear this jacket um, that was blue that looked like just right out of something Prince would wear. So I would always wear that. And um, But yeah, uh, I think I like worked it out of my system, but it took a good like, I don't know how many years because I was so hung up on the 80s. And I still am. Like, I think, I feel like I grew up on the 80s. Like I said, even though I was growing up out of the 80s, I really grew up on the 80s because that's what I was consuming more so than what I always feel like I've been a chosen consumer instead of a person that is is marketed to and accepts it. Like, I always question everything I'm marketed. I'm like, well, I'll choose what I listen to and what I watch. And I chose a lot of 80s stuff and even 70s. Like, I love I love a lot from the 70s, so I musically. Hear, I, hear, I don't know if you hear it, and I don't know if you're, if, if it's conscious on your end, but I do get, like, some low-key Bowie vibes. Like, mm-hmm. like specifically, like, like um, not necessarily, like, space oddity, but, like, aesthetically and, like, like, just auditorily like there's there's definitely like a 70s glam rock that's vibe. amazing I've never considered that at I've... least in Prince Lightmare right uh I could see it now that you mention it but I never like was that as much respect as I have for him which is like out of one to ten it's a ten for Bowie but like I was never that that person that was that like huge Bowie fan I was always like a Kate Bush fan, uh, Tori Amos, um, Michael Jackson, of course, Madonna, big time. So those were like the main people. So if there's like a Bowie-esque thing, it's just, I'm proud to say natural. And it's not like a forced thing yeah. because I never like really got into him. Probably more his movies than his music, actually. Like The Man Who Fell to Earth. Uh, can we, should yeah. we do a hour because it's on? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God! I will watch it. I will watch it. It's it's a great movie. Um, and I love, of course, the androgyny. Like I love androgyny. I'm not afraid of being a gay artist. I never like. I don't make that the centerpiece of what I do. But I'm. I just think it's obvious. So I don't like say I'm a gay artist every two seconds because I feel like it's so obvious. But um, at the same time, like I'm not afraid to like have that be part of my personality or be like a little feminine here, or even wear like lipstick and something, or so, you know, it's, or like, you know, curl my hair or dye it whatever color, or, so there's a little androgyny, maybe that's what ties it to Bowie. I thought you had a wife and two kids. You're talking about now? Yoda, that's it. (laughs) So, you know what I mean? Like, I think because that's a part that, that's like tied to my personality, that there, there's a little androgyny there, and so. Which I think is the sexiest thing, and I yeah. think, you know, if, if I may circle back to Madonna for a moment, um, she was, you know, not one of the original people by by any means. I mean, many pop stars before her, Nicks, Bowie, uh, going back to even like silent film stars, like there was Stevie Nicks, doing you know androgynous art, but right um, for somebody that grew up of you know in our generation our icon that you know aside from Bowie and Annie Nix Madonna like for me was like the first person because I had Annie Lennox and Bowie because my mom introduced right. me. I didn't grow up watching them on TV or listening to them but I did right. when Madonna right. put a corset over the pinstripe pants and right. then you have Jackson do the same thing and you have this he was wearing the leotard over the pants yeah. with so the like, jock strap. Yeah. You know, for me, Madonna and, and Michael are, are, those are my king and queen and, and you'll never take. <sighs> so great. Um, and I, I grew up watching and going to the midnight showings of Rocky Horror Picture Show. And, and um, th- so that was a big part of my youth of not being afraid to wear fishnet stockings and heels. And I think we're all starting to awaken to the fact that gender is there's so much more fluidity to it and that it it's not a binary thing that it's a scale and that people are all in different places on that scale and um that we're all sweet transsexual transvestite yeah Pennsylvania yes 
Yeah, so come on, Tim. Uh, yeah, amazing. Incredible. So that's well, one of my favorite movies. And I just think that, um, you know, and I love RuPaul. So I, I always preach about RuPaul. I, I love RuPaul. Yeah. So I just think like uh, drag is like, um, and just androgyny and playing with that is kind of fun to experiment and just to really be like live completely open in that area of your life is fun and exciting. And there's too many times where society has forced men to act more masculine and women to act more feminine. And there's a lot of freedom in like totally dismissing that and just being, being however you want to be. Yeah. Well, that's a great place to end it. I think with that, um, I will make sure to outro this video with a little bit of Prince Lightmare so everybody can hear Chad's amazing artistry. And of course, as always, his uh, information will be linked below. Please check it out. He's on SoundCloud. He's on everywhere. He's on the tunes. He's on the YouTubes. He's on the Facebooks. You're going to find him. I will link it all below. Um, thank you all for coming into this time machine journey to 1985 and um like i said if you loved aliens we knew you were gonna love desperately seeking susan look at that iconic if you love desperately seeking susan we know you're gonna love what we have coming up next which is a deep dive into bong joon ho's parasite look at oh uh, yes and snow piercer yeah don't even give me don't don't even say those words do you have a picture of her painting her toenails no, but it is that scene. It is during that scene. Well, that's her well, with Rosanna be, Arquette. Be kind to one another. Be and kind and rewind. Be kind and rewind before you return to the video store. There she is, Will Patton in this psycho fight. Oh my god, look at yeah. this. Yeah, she looks uh, so gorgeous there. Look at it. Always gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, that dirty dishwater blonde. I can't. Right, I love it. it but was so, we got to talk more about her in another video. Oh, we're series, going to, but we're all going to through Zerdare and Trey Capote. Like it's it's coming. Right. It's inevitable. Yep. It's coming out of our systems, and you guys aren't going to like it. Chad might not even like it, but I would really like to do a deep dive into some Michael Jackson, into some Moonwalker, into some Captain yeah. EO, uncharted territories. <laughs> controversial territory i would love you to lead us in a captain eo i think with some good research that could be a really good one i got your francis ford copes i got your george lucas i got your angelica houston i got your michael <laughs> i love it got your fuzzball okay. anyways we invite you to subscribe hooter uh hooter oh my god just please Please let me do Captain Neo so I can link the video of me dancing at your house to Captain Neo. Um, yes. Thank you for watching this Desperately Seeking Susan video that turned into so much more. Um, please subscribe. Um, please comment below. Uh, share any facts or anything relevant or irrelevant. Turn on the notification bell so you know when the next chat and mobile VR drops. And um, give the video a thumbs up. And I think those are all the things you're supposed to do on YouTube. If I'm forget, look, shake those tatas, shake those tatas. Yes, honey. Um, yeah. So um, we took you to church. You're welcome. And uh, I guess cheers. We'll see you on the other side. Shake those tatas. See you on the other side. Your yes. turn to shake it. Just I got Betty White straight up. Straight